Good evening. Welcome to Loud Poets. Please clap your hands, stamp your feet, and make some noise for your host and compare, Mark Galley. Yes, that is what I need on my Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night at the Fringe. How are we all doing? Are we well? Fantastic. Good to hear. As the very handsome voice said, my name is Mark Galley. This is Loud Poets Best of Fringe. Thank you so, so much for coming. Give me a wee cheer if you've been to a spoken word event before. Okay, okay. The majority of you, the majority of you. Good, good, good. Give me a wee cheer if this is your first ever spoken word show. Far, far more timid and a lot further away from the front. I see, I see, I see. Well, whether this is your first show or whether you have been to a million, if you are new, welcome. If you have been before, welcome back. This is Loud Poets Best of Fringe, the show where we put on the UK's absolute tippity top spoken word talent. Tonight is no exception. We have three incredible poets for you and we will be seeing them over the course of three different rounds tonight in the very first round this will be our introduction to the poets they will come out one at a time and introduce themselves to you by way of their poetry in the second round we will introduce a little bit of uh, chaos into the beautiful world of poetry some much much needed chaos i personally feel and um, with our poetry jukebox round and finally we will move on to our feature sets where our three poets will have 10 minutes to really construct themselves and show you what they can do basically does that sound good Oh, you started so strong, guys. You started so strong, the energy's dipped way a lot. If I'm getting to the end of this hour, you guys are coming with me. I said, are you ready for that? Yeah. Good, 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 good. Our first performer is one of my absolute favorites. They have been since the very first time I saw them. They are an incredible poet, director, actor. They are one of those people that has so many strings to their bow. It's no longer a bow, it's a harp now. So um, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome to the stage. Put your hands together and make some noise for the one, the only, Sarah Graham! Hello, looking like a sexy pillowcase. <laughs> this is a poem that is about that one aunt. If I say everyone in that family has the one auntie, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, if you are like, no, it's because you are the auntie. <laughs> this is a bit manty mazy. I pull sticky hands into the sleeves of my coat and she beats her stick on the ground and croaks, hurry up hen, I'll no wait forever. Maisie is my father's great aunt, a cantankerous old witch. Twitching her eye, roller stuck to the back of her head, came out the womb, fag in hand. A chimney stack birth, starting fires with her every breath, and it only gets worse for there. Born and bred in Glasgow West, my babysitter and my teacher, her stories were the best. This poem will never do her justice, but I have to try, so this is the story of Maisie and how Maisie died. My first memory of her. We were shopping for a coat, but Maisie had one of those let dowager hump things. And I never like, quite knew why, and my auntie Caroline said, how about a nice camel coat, Maisie? <laughs> That's the day I learned to say, fuck off, eat shit and die. <laughs> Her husband, Huey, was a tugboat captain with a port in every harbour. Two families that knew nothing about his, each other. He went first. And as he lay waiting to die, Maisie sat munching on four mince pies. He struggled to breathe, so she leaned close in, chucked her dear old husband on the chin and said, eh, keep your pecker up, shug, and left. <laughs> Seven years old, I sat in her living room when the call came to say he died. She says, aye, that's him away. <laughs> then looked me dead in the eye and went, I won. Maisie blazed her way through her life, living in her liquor. The next dance was always a fight. Swearing was punctuation and she always, always, always had a light. I'll never forget the March night. Gathered round her hospital bed, every fag she ever smoked, rattling through the room, mask on, muffled speech. Once she put it on her head to talk, her hair messed up. And my aunt says, oh, let me fix your hair, Maisie. She goes, don't worry, hen, the undertaker will fix it for me. <laughs> I looked around unsure of what to do because I'm pretty sure that laughing would have been frowned upon in that particular room. As she drew her last, she fought to speak. The mask came off and she cried, I think I've shot myself. <laughs> her daughter leans in and goes, no, mum, that was just me. I just farted. Maisie laughs, ah, dirty bastard, and died. <laughs> 
We all fell silent and took a deep breath in. Try not to be the first one to grin. Somebody let out the tiniest giggle. And the walls came down with me. In the middle, the nurses burst in, drawn by our roars to see us rolling around, howling like pack animals. Tears on our faces, thank yous on our moans as Maisie floated away, carried off by our mirth. And we started telling stories of her and our chimney stack birth. I want to live like my Auntie Maisie. I want to blaze my way through my limited days. I want to be an absolute absolute menace. Make people laugh with my every sentence. I'm going to the grave with a mocking bow and a wonky oxygen mask stuck to my brow. I'll leave them all wanting a little more when I go fuck an encore. If I kick the bucket, don't waste your tears. Just piss your pants over our memories and years. If I go tomorrow, that is okay with me because I've made you laugh and you've made me happy and somewhere out there, Maisie beats her stick on the ground and she still waits for me. Thank you. Sarah Grant! I love that poem. Every single time I hear it, I've never been more annoyed. I'll never get to meet a person <laughs> um, with that poem. Thank you so much. Our next performer is someone who is much more sort of recent in my personal um, sort of discovery of them. They first. Uh, came to our attention coming down to our open mics down at, at Kilderkin and uh, they've absolutely just blew me away from the very very start that we were in uh, a month ago in July when we were putting on a show with Bad Betty we were like would you like to come along they went, oh I love Bad Betty They're, I'm a very big fan of the work I'm like of course you are you're so lovely and wonderful and talented and then they came along and proved exactly how lovely and wonderful and talented they are so I'm very excited for you to see how lovely and wonderful and talented they are comes in threes give it up for the amazing Themo H. P. I, I totally just tripped on that step. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was asked to read a poem to introduce us as writers, and I thought I would follow in the footsteps of the likes of Alanis Morissette and Carly Simon and TLC and um, say a no scrubs poem. Um, just a disclaimer. Um, at the person's request, I have not used their name in the poem. I would, however, like to dedicate this to that special someone. <laughs> Dave Coulier. <laughs> it's not about him, but I just thought he'd be three for three, so why not? <clears throat> Criminal Minds. Don't use my name, you asked, tenderly tracing your edge down my cheek, daring a rebuttal. It dripped with excitement, and its cool wetness tingled on my skin, turning every stagnant thing inside me soft and flowing. Your love was instructive in its pain. As you tugged at the edges of myself, I breathed deeply and tried not to flinch under your gentle pinpricks and barbs, trusting the sting to be sweet, my heart full at attention. No names, you told me, and called me a dream. Unleashing a torrid fantasy detached from your insults and fear of abandon? No names, I agreed, and severed my ties to the inexorable truth that this fetish cuts both ways. I gave permission and exchanged my love for lazy sentimentality. I thanked you, rubbing my knees raw in pursuit of your heels. And when you snarled that I wasn't fast enough, I scurried on gravel and grass until their sharpness caked my tattered skin. Don't use my name, you barked, snapping shut clamps and gags, zipping up the sopping airless hood. I gasped and mouthed a vow in sweat-soaked darkness as you pinned me down and butterflied my body to begin your gorgeous work. No need for names when I'm spoiled with the signatures of your craft. You bruised with kisses on my neck, my shoulders, my cheek, my chest, anywhere but my lips. You crisscrossed my ribs with tenter hooks and peeled back defenses in one swift rip. I stifled a sob in hope that this cruelty was care and my submission would rouse me from rouse you from a sanguinous rage. You struck at my weak spots when I finally succumbed to my body alive with fire and cried as if speechless screams could spell an acrostic of your name, a grievous lament, a simple cipher leading everyone to what you'd done. Don't use my name, you whispered, a selfish remedy between parting lovers. I smelled the salty blood on your breath, and it made me miss the person I was who took it all, 
the incisive looks and backhanded words you were always willing to give. And with every lash of silence between our last farewell and now, the strictures of your love tear away. I draw breath, my throat cracked and weeping, the ache and shame of what we did burning in every muscle from my eyes to the toes that still miss you. I say your name, and the sound dies on empty walls and deaf sheets. There are no bystanders or ransom for a willing victim of love. Themo H. Oh, amazing. You see what I mean, right? Um, our final performer we have to introduce you to is one who I've had an awful lot of time for, also for a very, very long time. They are an absolute titan of the spoken word scene, not just in Scotland, not just in the UK, but much, much further beyond. They are incredible. They are stupendous. They are so much more than a mediocre white man. It's Kevin P. Guilty! <laughs> Speaking of mediocre white men. <laughs> I was going to do something else, but fuck it, it's fine. <clears throat> I hear them like a military choir, singing a stereophonics chorus. An army of steel pasty men put on this earth to bore us. Old Spice is a chosen scent, dick pics his pickup lines, even Stevie fucking wonder could read the warning signs. Stinking of desperation, reeking of booze, I've got the mediocre white man blues. I've got a mediocre white man blues. I've got a mediocre white man blues. They've got to read no social cues. I've got the mediocre white man blues. As a wanky student at the party, not embarrassed to show it. The poor fucker's read Bukowski and he wants you to know it. Starts quoting lines of Joyce, like he's the first cunt ever reading them. If he starts on a Dostoevsky, I'm sticking the fucking heed in him. A conversational turning of the screws. I've got the mediocre white man blues. I got the mediocre white man blues. I got the mediocre white man blues. It's up to me to pick and choose. I've got the mediocre white man blues. Dissecting five asides like it's the World Cup final. I much prefer their earlier stuff, and it sounds better on vinyl. Tell us about your fitness regime, so unrelentingly grim. Who needs a personality when you've got the gym? Ten inch biceps, size five shoes. I've got the mediocre white man blues. I got the mediocre white man blues. I got the mediocre white man blues. No need to hide my problematic views. I've got the mediocre white man blues. You can't say anything nowadays. You tweet to your 10 followers. No irony to be spared amongst your clan of keyboard warriors. This isn't a free speech issue. There's no overflowing queue. You've not been deplatformed. Just no cunt wants to book you. Who let this wank on the 10 o'clock news? I've got the mediocre white man blues. I got a mediocre white man blues. I got a mediocre white man blues. Pick Tan Rand is my hipster muse. Now I've got the mediocre white man blues. All the opportunity I was promised has been stolen from me. Served up silver platter style with a diverse snowflake decree. The future I was entitled to has been taken by those who want it. My story is old, been told, shoved down throats till we vomit. Maybe I need to admit that I'm responsible for this spew. Cause I'm a mediocre white man too. I've got a mediocre white man blues. I've got a mediocre white man blues. Nothing left to learn, nothing left to lose. I've got the mediocre white man blues. Thank you. Gavin B. Gilday! Oh my! We are in for a hell of a night. Um, 
that is our first round. Those are your poets. That is how they have chosen to introduce themselves to you. Um, but we move on to our second round, because even with that round, they have quite a lot of time to prepare an introduction, and they have, as I said, chosen how you get to view them. So with this next round, we get rid of all of that preparation time with Poetry Jukebox. Now, how this round works is our poets are all going to line up behind me underneath this wonderful projector, and our beautiful technician in the, ro uh, in the booth, Roddy, is going to project a different, random, one-word prompt onto that screen, and that is all our poets are going to have as they fight, I try every time to encourage them to, as they fight their way to the mic, fight poets, um, <laughs> fight their way to the mic in order to shoehorn in a poem as best they can. Does that make sense? Yeah. We've all seen Mock the Week, we all understand how this goes by this point. Anyone from the BBC in? Doesn't hurt to ask. Um, well, on that note, please join me in welcoming back to the stage all of our beautiful poets! Which, I mean, now that I've lined you up, I feel like I've missed like some sort of dress code <laughs> meeting. Um, I'm really letting the side down, but we'll see. Poets, are you ready? Yes. You've been <laughs> still the most ready they've been. We're in show 18 at this point, and that is the most ready poets have been. Audience, are you ready? Yeah. Well then, Roddy, can we have the first category, please? Moon. Not, Not ready. <laughs> All these put no, the moon, the night. I mean, I, yeah, oh, uh, yes! There we go, there you go. There, ah, come on. Um. <laughs> Mother Nature's Last Journal Entry, October 1991. Every year I see it, the leaves bright-eyed and green. They burn and reach and reach until they see it, the coming season a premonition. The cold, the forces of endless night, a sharp moon <laughs> ripping through bark in chlorophyll like rice paper. The sun's fighting return, new buds, then days like those that came before. The leaves see it, a retelling of the same tale. Then one by one, each angry leaf, anxious to escape, chilly regrets, let's go. Very nice, very nice had moon in it. What were you worried about? <laughs> well, can we see, Roddy, can we roll the dice again, please? Rhythm. Poets, not musicians. Nothing, there's nothing, but I feel bad for, for using your one earlier now. Okay, all right, we get, the, we get one free reroll. I think that's fair. So, Roddy, can we go one more? Dream. That's the one I wanted. That's the one you want. Go again, there is no rule. Um, I said fight. <laughs> Address. I saw her laughing at London, pulling at failed skin, stretch marks like braille, reading, the b reading back the difficulties of fattening a youth on kimchi and pickled eggs. A thin layer of powder, then thigh-length mismatched socks hid the rest of her story, armor to ward off smiles any beautiful girl would get, her eyes only catching pavement. But still she saw me, a thing, a dress, the dress a kimchi-gorged little girl had waited a lifetime for red and smooth like satin tears to find only flattering curves. Through the window she stared at me, a beautiful prayer, the lines of my back cut low revealing the small of hers, the dragon tattoos there erased only in her dreams. She closed her eyes and held me, fingers pressed to the glass and we danced, danced like children in a field's abandon, elation lightening the lashes and tattoos of her past. And then she twirled away, down the city pavement, twice my cost, patting her anything but fuck me boots. She twirled and twirled, a girl in love, all the way home, to another girl, no stories on her skin in the dress of her dreams. Very nice, very nice. Although saying that was the one you wanted ruins, we're pulling back the curtain here, Thema. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see what other completely random prompts we have as we ask Roddy to roll again. Sex! If none of you move, I'll be surprised. <laughs> the fighting bit encouragement really has fallen apart a little bit here, hasn't it? Poets are too fucking polite, that's what the issue is. Okay, um, I've got so many sex poems, it's unbelievable. Uh, okay, here's a really quick one, right? Um, <laughs> disgusting. 
It's called Unintentionally Hilarious Freesome. <laughs> it's hard to fit two heads between two legs. The sensation of four hands mapping, two mouths overlapping. Harder still after five pints and a pill. So put my lolling tongue to use. Feed me extremities till I choke. Sit in my face like an armchair. Because tonight I'm playing snooker with a rope. Cheers. Fantastic stuff, fantastic stuff. I mean, I'll s if you can get to the mic before I ask Roddy to roll again, I guess sex would still technically be on the table. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> um, no, 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 we're good. All right, Roddy, let's have one. Final category, please. Color. Because <laughs> I'm a fucking rebel! <laughs> this is a poem about rage, which is red. <laughs> Shoehorn! <laughs> All right. Okay. On an episode of Mythbusters, the team conducted an experiment entitled Do Bigger Breasts Mean Bigger Tips in the Service Industry? What the fuck? <laughs> the short answer is yes. As a veteran of six years in the service industry and the owner of some stellar knockers, I have this topic so pinned down to a science that, in a, that in a coffee in Canada in Hooters came with an application form. My service with a smile gets me chat, banter, confession sometimes, but my service with the top buttons on my shirt undone gets me money in the service industry. It is never about what you want. The customer is always right. The customer only wants you to serve. So I learned to smile with burning eyes and burning hands. Their gaze five inches south, but it's fine because it pays well. <laughs> So, unnecessary Mythbusters experiment, yes, well done, I knight the masters of the fucking obvious. And while we're on the subject of Mythbusting, one, yes, the real, two, no, I don't feel anything in them, three, I don't know why, but sometimes when I accidentally hit my nipple off something, it takes three seconds for the pain to catch up, like, ah, four, <laughs> nothing fits me ever, five, no, I've never knocked myself out with my own breasts. <laughs> sometimes I wish I had, though, because I'm certain a punch in the face is less painful than these questions. The last man who saw me naked got angry with me because I was uncomfortable. To be fair, he was trying to kiss my tip while we were watching an episode of Preacher. <laughs> Baby, he said, you've had these things your whole life. Don't be greedy, let me have my fun. The last guy who shoved me up against the wall without my consent didn't even look at my face. His gaze five inches south and skipped out on the bill. My best friend wants to be a father. We talk about children often and he judged me when I said I wasn't sure whether I wanted them. I'd be missing out on the opportunity to feed the children I'm scared to have in the service industry. It's never about what you want. My mother says she only has small breasts because she breastfed and I feel the need to apologise for taking away her worth. When they told my grandmother the bad news, she submitted to the scalpel. When they told her sister May, she never said anything at all. May was gone by the time they told her daughter Kim. The women in my family have been dissected enough. Are we just pieces of flesh, fresh and ready for consumption? No, because I spent years of my life building this body into a home that I am happy to live in. This body is the armor for my organs. Stop asking me if I'm afraid to lose that thing that makes me a woman. Honey, I learned to smile while everything is on fire. I have been dissected enough. I'll submit to the scalpel like my grandmother before me and sure go ahead take out that thing that makes me a woman just you make sure you leave in that thing that makes me a warrior this house cannot be torn down from the outside this body is more than just flesh I am not packaged or marketed or chilled so no more of my burning eyes or their bloody hands because I don't work in the service industry anymore thanks <laughs> Sensational stuff, and what a perfect way to end off that round. So a big round of applause for our poets as we sit them back down. <laughs> outstanding stuff, outstanding stuff. Still haven't quite got the fighting to the death I'm after, but there's still time. Um, we are moving on to our third round, our feature sets, but just to give our poets a little moment to, you know, compose themselves, take a drink of water, I get to do the most fun part of any show, which is the plugs. Um, so upstairs, you might uh, notice before, we have a merch table that is absolutely chock-a-block full with all of the fringe flyers of poets and um, artists that we've had over the course of this run. Um, there are still quite a lot of them going up until the 28th. Um, so please do check that out. Um, as I say, some of the uh, poets we have here have also got books and stuff for sale at, 
up there. So please do, if you want to support a bit more than you already have, um, which we are very appreciative for, that is the place to do it. We also have a mailing list uh, up there where you can sign up to find out not just what's happening at I Am Loud or Lab Poets, but much more further abreast in the UK spoken word scene. There is so, so much. Don't let the fringe booklet, you know, deceive you it is always spoken word is always the smallest section and i think these guys have absolutely proven the sheer breadth of content and uh, enjoyment that you can get f from that so yeah if you have the chance go up check out the merch sale and if you can um support you know if you for books or things like that tell a poet you like them if it can't be food then god let it be validation <laughs> uh, oh even that mm, mm, thank you thank you thank you Hmm. <laughs> the more you do it, the more it fuels me. Um, but it is not about me. It is about our wonderful poets, and I am very excited to introduce them back to the stage. So the first poet, you already have seen them all. You are already, hopefully, big, big fans. Uh, but if you are not, then I want you to go absolutely wild. Clap your hands, stamp your feet, shake the walls as we welcome back the absolute menace that is Sarah Grant! <laughs> How short do you think I am? I'm in heels, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was so confident. I had like five poems prepared for that last round. Roddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is where we build our home. The land holds no bones of that before, which is an optimistic thought. We'll lay foundations of optimistic thoughts and we will work without blueprints. Have no idea what we're doing. It's more fun that way. An impossible will always be easier in ignorance. There will be no ignorance here, except that one. There will be questions, building blocks of questions and walls of, what the fuck do I know? And space to grow. We'll grow things here. We will not follow the metric system or landmarks mapped out in the ages of our parents. Time has no pressure here. Time only heals here. In this house, we will undo all the buttons, let out all the curtains, leave things open to the air, and finally, when the dust settles and we look at what we've made, it will resemble nothing like we ever expected. Nothing like I hoped or was taught to hope. It will be new sleeping arrangements and shared closets, hinges that creak now and furnishings that change when you aren't looking. It will not be like the house my father built or the castles in our histories, but it will keep out the rain, make it wait for an invitation, spill messy music over clean floors, set the stage for all our endings, love its differences, welcome its changes with fresh hope and safety in us. Cheers. <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to be here uh, tonight because um, I'm debuting a lot of new work. I was very fortunate to get some Creative Scotland funding to work on my brand, like my first ever debut collection, which is out at Publishers just now. And this is the first time I ever got to do any work at any time performing it, so I'm really excited. Um, the poetry collection was edited by the wonderful Katie Ailes, who is a member of Loud Poets, and she's performing at the show afterwards. So if you've never been here and you don't have any plans after and you enjoy tonight, get a ticket for the next one. It's going to be the most amazing show. So um, my work is predominantly in film. I do a lot of uh, work for screen and um, there's a lot of perfectionism in being the female director kicking down all the doors. So the collection is called Hero. It's about perfectionism and the hero's journey. And I'm going to do a piece from it. Notes on the hero. It's obvious who the hero is. You can't stop staring at her, she is magnetic. Everything she does is so full of valour slash honour slash epicness that she takes up all the space in the world. No, not kindness. I mean, yes, well, kindness, but kindness has no magnetism. True kindness is a mirror, she is a light. Look at her, so damn flawlessly good. Everything you think is good, she is. Everything you are taught is good, taught to aspire to, she is. You are in safe hands. You cannot get lost. She is so easy to follow. I mean, seriously, she speaks in narrative platitudes. So predictable there should be a manual. There probably is a manual. Maybe that's what she follows. It would make her life so much easier to follow step by step, I guess. Easier knowing there will be a happy ending. There will be a happy ending, right? She earned it. How could there not be otherwise she wouldn't be the hero? A production memo. Notes for the cinematographer. 
This book has an aesthetic grounded in realism. Don't get me wrong, I want it to look Hollywood as shit. All that new, funky, young, vibrant, neon lighting you get on the Netflix teen movies like To All The Boys I've Loved Before, etc. But you know, keep it working class. <laughs> and Glaswegian. <laughs> this book needs to bring a little sparkle to the scheme. At no point should we be seeing this book through the tired poverty porn tropes used in so many other books. There's more to us than that. Remember to show joy when you can. Kids flying a blue corner shop plastic bag as a kite. Keep it whimsical as fuck. <laughs> The hero must feel like a main character, but real. We need to use wide sweeping shots to show the intimate macro of her every thought and emotion. Huge scale production value to feel the constraints of class. We can do that, right? Notes for the production designer. My darling, you have the hardest job of the team as you need to dress this small slice of life that is west of Glasgow, not even the trendy west, the border between the trendy and the scummy west, in all the trappings and teachings of the whole globe. Our hero must feel like she is worldly and knowledgeable, too big for the tiny country she calls home, but still like she fits in, belongs, dress her in clothes that somehow both like they are the first thing she grabbed from the washing basket and a carefully put together artsy chic ensemble. <laughs> hang too many frames in her flat and have an intense backstory for each one. Fill decorative boxes on the bookshelves with things she doesn't like talking about. We need to make this space feel lived in, real. Use all the budget you need, but remember she's working class, so don't make it look like she can afford nice things. Make everything in the background essential because it is. It so is. Everything has its place in this story and the hero couldn't possibly be who she is without every single one of them. Doesn't matter that the audience doesn't care. I care. We can do that, right? Notes for the editor. First and foremost, this is a comedy. <laughs> Don't let the abuse, eating disorders and friendships falling apart fool you. This is a comedy. Get that drama shit gone. <laughs> Regarding the edit, I want it to hit all the classic comedy beats. Remember, make it pacey so fast you almost miss the self-deprecation and the pain that went into the making of the gag. Get to the gag and get out quick. And of course, always cut to the wide on the punchline. The wider, the better. To be honest, it wouldn't be a bad thing if you couldn't see Rohiro's face at all. As long as you can see the throngs of people laughing in the wider world being made better by the joke, comedy makes things better. Make people laugh. It is always the most important thing in this book. Thanks. <laughs> So that's a little snippet of Hero and my brain, which is hopefully coming soon. Um, I just have one more uh, before I do it, but thanks very much for having me. It's been a wonderful night, and please do stick around for the next show because it's going to be banging. Uh, this is called Happy Jokes and Content Warnings. <laughs> uh, this one comes with a content warning for eating disorders, and it starts with a joke. How do you tell someone new, a new friend that you used to suffer from an eating disorder? I don't know how to bring this up, but sometimes I can't help it. <laughs> See, it's not funny, is it? But I, I do that sometimes. I, I make a joke to break the tension. Mention that time I made a fool of myself. Or just to make you smile, I like to make you smile. See, when you're a fat kid with seven extra teeth and glasses that make you look like an owl that's been punched in the face, they tell you, at least you're funny. <laughs> yeah, they tell you that. She's no looker, but she's smart and she's funny. You're damn fucking right I am. I am so funny. I trained my whole skeleton to cry laugh when cracked and broken, inhaled self-deprecation and so deeply in one draw, I was down to the butt of the joke. I trained my laugh to be the biggest thing in the room so no one would notice my body was. I was so smart. I realized this was the only way that I was ever going to win. And I like to win. Classic Gemini. <laughs> I like the taste of being someone's right medicine at the right time, swallowed the responsibility of bringing the party, scarfed down what I thought was the only love I was deserving of, forgot the meaning of nourishment for a while. I'm aware I'm skipping over a part of the story, but I won't show you the scars before they've truly healed. I don't know quite how to show you the meal I made of myself without asking you to swallow it. This is me telling you I don't know how to talk about it yet. 
but I'm so funny. I made my own laughter, the right medicine at the right time. I'm so smart. I transform battle armor into band-aid with a smile. Fat and ugly kids learn kindness like it's a museum exhibit. Far off and behind glass, but so beautiful. It is worth hanging on the walls for everyone to see. My body is a gallery I stand in awe of every day when my aunt tongue-tied and gin-heavy said the only way I could look at my naked body and be happy was if I had a mental illness. I couldn't hate her for it because I knew she spat it from a body that looks more like mine than my mother's. Knew it was with the cold sting of self-loathing I used to suck on like ice cubes. I knew the calorie count of her bitter words mixed like lemons into water in the morning. Instead of breakfast, I could hear the clicking of her counter. I didn't counter her mean words. I didn't tell her the fact that I could look at my strong, healthy, beautiful, naked body and be happy because the voices in my head calling me ugly are the only things I've starved in years. Happy, evicted this mental illness, called out for being the squatter it was. Happy as a tenant who keeps the curtains open and welcomes everyone in for a meal. Happy, gives bits of herself to those that she loves, knows the true meaning of nourishment. Happy, forgives the ones who saw this body at its sickest and said, well done, keep going, you look fantastic because happy doesn't let us hold on to the things that make us sick. Happy knows that you can smile and laugh without inviting others to be laughing at you. Knows that some jokes aren't funny, some stories are private and we don't know oh, either to anyone. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing, amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Loud poets drawing that fine line between poetry and entertainment and group therapy session. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll ask how you feel at the end. Uh, for now, we move on to our next poet, who is the truest testament to the topic of tenderness you will ever see. It is Themo H. P. L. I love how he mentions group therapy right before I start reading about dissociation. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, so yes, so um, these are my I'm a poet and I have feeling poems. Um, I do suffer from PTSD and uh, one of the manifestations of that is dissociative episodes. Um, for you, those of you who don't know, that just means that sometimes when in extreme stressful situations, my brain just goes, you don't need to be here. Um, and the, in one of the things that you learn to deal with that is to learn to sit with your emotions. And as a poet, that means writing about them and then testing that stress response by reading it to a room full of people <laughs> to see if I remember it at the end of the night. We'll find out. Um, so this first one is actually just a Dear John letter to Dissociation. Dear Dissociation, I miss you. In forgetting to forget, I've seen so many things I should have missed. I realize how much you made life bearable, your gentle wool over my eyes, muffling my brain from the screams and sobs whose echoes I could only feel inside. I remember the first time I saw you, walking in the garden of my mind, the gray grit landscape scattered with shadowy curves of the past like disturbed earth, dark heaving mounds seething with decay. Are these my memories? I asked, approaching, eager to dig for crawling nightmares. Don't worry, my love, you said, taking my hand, your hypnotic voice a crackling fog of enveloping stupor. For years, you were the comfy cape, making me a hero, impervious to harm, ignorant of danger, my loving, unreliable narrator, sketching moments of triumph in place of daily defeat. You whispered me to sleep when I was scared, creating gentle distractions like lullabies, sending me off to new and perfect worlds. But one day you changed. You started saying things when I was out of the room, making my case before the world in words I'd never use. You leapt to my defense in ways unseemly, like telling that boot-faced bitch her son was relieved to be adopted so he didn't have to share her hateful genes. You buried the evidence in the gray, hiding the means, but left me holding the bloody hammer, a trail of muddy footprints to my door. 
And I know I asked you to leave. I said I'd be better off without your honey-soft oblivion because the truth will set me free, right? I hate it here without you. There are so many feelings and fears I didn't know existed. So many reasons to feel an ache besides the Herculean trauma that breaks me over its knee, leaving a limp and weeping mess like a dropped bag of ice. Did you know movies can make you cry? That when the dog dies, it's not supposed to be funny? It's not even a real dog. It's a dog actor. <laughs> so why the fuck am I crying? I'm crying because I've lost you, dissociation. I'm crying because our years together left me unnettled and intolerant of emotive flora. You shielded me, murdering feelings and laying them out like offerings in that beautiful graveyard away from the sharp, heavy light of day. And now I feel it all. I really miss you, dissociation. Feeling this awful, soft gushiness that lets me weep at weddings or funerals or births is for people who haven't seen real shit. Without you, I'm an old soul that is made up of holes and pointless everyman highs and lows, and it hurts. I know I shouldn't want you back. But on days when I see the graves of yesterday stretched behind me and days ahead lined up like a gauntlet of fear and joy, armed with their fearsome gold-tipped weapons, I know that I only have one purpose, to live. And it's scary. And I know you won't come back. You can't. I've paid too much to get over you, and I know what it is that we really had. These days, there's green-gray grass growing between fertile mounds, and I'm soothed to sleep with actual memories of my day. Sometimes those memories keep me awake, but I've got sleeping pills and mindfulness apps, a passable compromise to you, at least until good days come back. But I still miss you, dissociation. Every time I squeeze the teddy bear I bought in a fugue state because I was lonely, or when some dog actor makes me feel like a fucking idiot, sobbing into a pillow and a glass of wine. I can never forget you, dissociation. I will always think of you when I look at old photos that happened to someone else or catch the silent scars you gave me riding my body into battle. I will always remember you whenever I start to feel everything, and especially when I forget to forget. So I turned 40 a few days ago, and I know, I don't look a day over 25, um, but my knees actually tell the truth, so you'll get to see that in a second. Um, this poem, um, but for my 40th birthday, I've booked a trip to Japan, which I'm very excited about, and um, a friend, Lorna, who's there, so feel free to take pictures, um, um, and I decided to challenge ourselves to write poems about competitiveness, and so I decided to write about how I'm going to absolutely crush this holiday. Um, <laughs> and this is the closest I'll ever get to performance poetry, so here we go. Oh, here we go, yeah, there we go. Uh. Uh, okay. Sumimasen. I bow, you bow, I bow lower. There are so many ways to say thank you in Japanese, but not quite enough I'm, for I'm sorry. Sumimasen. I'm visiting a friend in Japan, and the etiquette of gift giving there is well prescribed. I feel relief that my need to outdo and excel submits beneath established cultural norms of respect and caution. I have read all the guides, and when I meet her family, I will impress with my thoughtful, culturally appropriate, non-competitive gifts. I relax and let the warmth of conformity wash over me. I will be the best, most respectful gift giver from the West that ever was. And when I inevitably get it wrong, everyone will laugh politely, and I will study harder and bow lower and try not to be pressured to keep up with a culture that has edicts of propriety centuries older than my ancestors capture across the ocean. I allow the waves of discomfort to wash over me. I will be the most easygoing cultural pioneer from the West that ever was. <laughs> I've been practicing sitting on my knees. I've never been able to do that before, even when I was a kid. Uh, my hip flexors have always been restricted, like 
tight-fisted heat swollen hinges. But angry arthritic joints will obey as I practice squeezing my body lower and lower. I push down sick as the tides of pain flow through me. I will be the least agonized lowest knee sitter from the West that ever was. <laughs> I'm learning hiragana and katakana and time my recitations daily. I'm scribbling kanji in the margins of all my notebooks. See? <laughs> I can't say a word yet without the little owl in my phone, but I've learned rakyu and kintsugi and have been rolling sushi since college. I try not to drown in the fear of my inevitable failure. I will be the most humble, technology-dependent, bad Japanese speaker from the West that ever was. <laughs> When I get to Japan, I will learn to make authentic ramen and ancient styles of calligraphy. I will climb Mount Fuji, pay my respects at the monuments of Hiroshima, and get lost in the neon fever dream of Har Harajuku, just like a local. The travel agent says this is too much for three days, but I know I can do it. As, as long as I learn everything I need to know to get me through any awkward situation, I let my lungs fill as I sink beneath cultural appropriation. I will be the most least obvious overachiever from the West that ever was. When I get to Japan, they will see me a paragon of humility, transformed and ready to swim the sea of adulation pouring from their eastern faces. A koi carp casually ascended to the heights of tranquility through sheer grit and force of will. I will flounder, and I will bow lower, and I will rise better. <laughs> Arigato Nihon, sumimasen. <laughs> Suddenly realized I should have thought about that last bit while wearing a kilt. <laughs> It's just like, don't know. Uh, last one, um, just a poem about joy, and this is for my Edinburgh blue ball friends. Over the hill and through the waves. I lost my glasses in the waves, a selkie-shaped ballerino, pirouetting and spinning as they lift me, fingers pointing skyward, barely brushing the sun. The water washes me with ageless abandon, making grown men giggling mermaids, sputtering salt and sand until judgment and woe are surf, bro surf broken on beds of communion. The icy North Sea pushes it all out, sorrow drifting further away, unbuoyed and sinking, my body numb to weighty cares, melancholy ripped free, unnoticed into undertow. I stay there. Stinging cool skin, smiling as waves churn endless blue champions, like mad kelpies dragging the last thrashing burden away, never to be seen again. I lost my glasses in the waves, and I'm blinded by the cold morning sea. The salt air and laughter wrap me in sonorous ball, opening me up to their gifts and freedom. Thank you. What fantastic stuff, so emotional. I am still reeling from your 40? <laughs> yeah, I was, just, I was like, you can't be like, what is in the middle of his set? But like, no, I don't believe you. Um, I do admire the dedication to the holiday though. I'm going on holiday next weekend. I've made none of those preparations. <laughs> don't even know what time my flight is. <laughs> Guys, we have come to the final performer of the evening, and there is only one way we can welcome them back to the stage, which is, for the uninitiated, the loud rumble. So, for those that are aware, for those that are not, I want you to start tapping your feet on the ground. Just a little, just a little bit, just a little bit at the start. Build it up a little bit more. For those that aren't doing the set, let's get those hands clapping on those, on those knees. Build it up, start putting them together. I want more, I want more. Scream the house down for the magnificent Kevin P. Gilday! Why have you stopped? <laughs> um, I'm going to do a few poems from my uh, new book, which uh, I'm quite excited about. It's coming out next month, and I'm really excited to share it with people. And it's nice to just be able to be in a space like this with amazing poets and amazing audience and, and share this work. So um, this is a poem about the kind of people that often get left behind in conversations about community. Um, it's the kind of people that we often disagree with, 
but are still an important part of our society. This is called the old men in Weatherspoons. <laughs> are angry about the politics. A Union Jack flops flaccidly, heralding the best of British ales, the sterile silence broken only by the rustle of a tabloid, sun, star, male, a bedraggled buffet of a breakfast club, reserved for the dedicated morning shift, pints are sipped while lines are reviewed, studiously ignoring the stench of pish. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Another migrant boat, another pointless vote, not anyone thought to ask them. They may as well be ghosts. Used to work every day. Trade sweat for respect, a modest check, but those days are gone, left with two dodgy knees and a crick in the neck. And this theme park pub harks back. A reconstruction of an ideal, distorted through golden arch economics, paint served with a fast food feel. But it's open early for business, and everyone keeps to themselves. The telly is tuned to Sky Sports News as the atmosphere compels. This is it. Born to shit. A plastic scrappy paw, formless wet. We exhaled and reviled, jizzed on the thick leather and unwanted stepchild. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Walked all their days just to get fuck all. Well, the paper says some immigrant prick gets a free smartphone to call home to whatever shithole country he sailed to escape. All those years of paying taxes was surely a mistake. How can they fail to feel that all power has been lost when control doesn't reside in calloused hands when ballot slips are crossed? So the pub becomes a dominion, a jurisdiction marked out in empties, Delineated by the 8-bit wail of the poggy machine devouring a wallet of Chris Twenties. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Coached in the rage from every angle. Trained to be incensed at the latest scandal. What opinion is yours to disentangle? When the papers scream blue murder and the TV edits the truth. The algorithm recommends conspiracy theories while the radio phone-in carries the proof. This is it. Born to shit. No trust for you feckless hypocrites. We exiled and reviled. Ignored by a cabal of wanting pedophiles. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. And I find it hard to blame them. An army of amateur analysts lining up to shame them. Have you ever felt forgotten? Like the world has left you behind? Thursday night means curry club. Debit card declined. Thank you. Sorry for shouting pedo on your night out. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like a little love poem? Yeah. yeah, of course you would. A short love poem, it goes like this. <clears throat> I hope I die at an orgy. being pummeled by an accountant from Falkirk <laughs> named Keith <laughs> on his day off from work fingering a Fiona with my outstretched hand as I attempt to breathe amongst the generous folds 
of a generous woman whose name I did not catch as we smiled across the buffet just a half an hour earlier. Thank you. I don't know if Audrey's really have buffets, but <laughs> in my head they do. I feel like like you'd want to get a wee snack in before, maybe during. Anyway, I'm sorry, I kind of tricked you there. Do you want an actual love poem? Yeah, okay. This is a breakup one, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Miserable bastard, okay. This one's called shiitake. I cook with mushrooms now. Feel their surfaces undulate from springy softness to earthy notes. I let my fingers read their story in organic braille. I find an excuse to put them in everything nowadays. Porcini in my pasta, button in my curry. I'm learning their attributes, curating my fungus for the correct culinary journey. It's the freshness that makes it exciting. Breaching a boundary without anyone to tell me no. You always said it was a texture. Oh, rubbery and slimy, alien growths fried up in a pan. But we pay a price and make a trade-off. And no longer will I smell the industrious entwining of onions and garlic sizzle from the next room. No longer will I glibly state that something smells good. And no longer will you tell me it's just onions and garlic. I will never again hear about the intrigue of your workday. Who said what to whom? Despite my love of mundane drama, I freed up precious time to wank myself into a coma <laughs> instead. You'd be proud of my spaghetti bolognese. I put in a little pesto, Worcestershire sauce for a kick, but I know you wouldn't try it. Not with all those mushrooms. You cooked more often than not. Me feigning ineptitude, born of laziness. Turns out it was both. And though I miss your intricately prepared meals, I am only five attempts away from mastering the perfect pasta bake. I'd say. I'm forever giving something up. Every inch earned must be returned elsewhere. And this freedom has cost us Ten years of laughter, of dinners, of photographs. Us at that pizzeria on our honeymoon. Waiter whispering Italian, smiling into the flash, even as it burned our retinas. Yours, a plain margarita. Mushrooms on mine. Thank you so much. I've got some copies of uh, Anxiety Music upstairs if you want to, to buy them on the way out. Um, it's not officially released yet, so it feels a wee bit kind of illicit to buy it just now. Um, but I won't tell anyone. <laughs> um, I've just finished doing a, a fringe run. I was doing a show called Spam Valley. It was all about uh, class, all about belonging. All about kind of wondering where you fit in with your class, especially when you do a middle class job such as poetry. <laughs> um, and I stay in what they call a, an area of multiple deprivation, <laughs> uh, Springburn in North Glasgow. And uh, it's a place that's beset with lots of issues, but also a place full of community spirit. Um, and, and unfortunately, extremely low life expectancy. There's a, a poem about that, but also a poem about resilience. It's called Excess Noun. We have too much round here, an excess in these parts. 
More than our fair share and enough to spare. Mortality. It seeps from our taps, a slow dancing poison. Climbs perilous out the window of the high flats. Dives for fag doubts outside the shopping centre. A surplus of this mortality. This city breathes it in. A profusion of cessation. Particles plunged into the air from ancient factory pipes laden with asbestos. An industrial nightmare oblivious to the winds of change. Down the road, they have just enough. But here, we are inundated. This Glasgow effect that turns beloved sons to drug addict statistics, that strips a diet down to tins and boxes, a glut of mortality. Your mother would always claim she didn't have a favourite. But it was definitely you. We could tell if she put you in the ground. Our dear green place is fertilised with the bodies of the forgotten. Your membership to that Tuesday morning methadone crew, your nerves jangling. Until one day, they didn't. And no one can tell us why. Why we keep dying. Why there's a funeral parlour in every scheme. Why our wake outfits hang heavy with expectation on the back of bedroom doors. So we learn to wallow in the waiting. Biding time till our turn Scanning the evening time's obituaries Memorialising colleagues and classmates Faces revealing themselves from foggy memory Like a brass rubbing Right enough The big man was near looking too good last I saw him They don't seem to have an answer As to why it resides here Our Asbo neighbour Aggressively lurking at the closed door Funny how this excess sits neatly in a postcode like a stray And for the life of you, for the life of us No one can say why What should I say to the teenage mothers Pushing firstborns and secondhand prams Babies fed on mould and spores Expectancy stunted, a lifetime interrupted By this exorbitant Mortality. And I wait every day for this invisible force to add me to the graph. An outlier marking the trend beside family and friends. Our little crosses recorded on a whiteboard. A sociologist's nightmare. I dispute the details of my mother's death certificate that did not record poverty, a lifetime of it, is cause. But around here, they call it excess mortality. They call it inevitable. They call it life. If they had the courage, they would call it what it is. They would call it genocide. Thank you so much. I've been Kevin Peagle Day. Sorry for ending on the word genocide. <laughs> Cheers. Kevin Gilday! <laughs> oh, amazing stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. That has uh, brought us to the end of the evening. Um, but just before I let you go, can we get one big round of applause for our wonderful technician in the booth, Roddy? <laughs> for all the staff here at the wonderful Scottish Storytelling Centre. And a big round of applause for your performers this evening, Sarah Grant, Themo H. Peel, and Kevin P. Gilday! This has been Loud Poets. I have been Mark Galley. You guys have been fucking incredible. Good night! Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.